Take out your Bibles, if you were, if you would, to turn to the book of Habakkuk. You all are going, Habakkuk, where is that? That is uh, one of the Old Testament minor prophets. Uh, in my Bible, it's page 720. That's not going to help you. Uh, but we're going to be in Habakkuk chapter 3 uh, this morning. And I want us to turn our thoughts uh, to really what it is to give thanks to God and really the ramifications of that and what that means. You know, I can remember when I was in school, and boy, that's been quite a while ago, I can remember learning about the first Thanksgiving. Do you all remember that? Uh, The year 1621, uh, in the spring, the uh, pilgrims, they land at Plymouth. They had a very hard winter, and they weren't doing very well. Many of them were dying from disease and from starvation. And there were several Native Americans that helped them and showed them how to plant crops, right? Showed them how to live off the land. Showed them what it was to have good farming techniques and good food. Um, I must confess that uh, this morning, um, as he always does, Uh, Gabe greeted me this morning, and he was not talking about good food. He was talking about the broccoli that he ate last night, and when he did it, he thought about me. Isn't that nice? (laughs) I love that you thought about me. But broccoli? Really? I'm not sure that they had broccoli here because, you know, I remember it was good food. Um, Nonetheless... Uh, It was because of the help that they received that things greatly improved, and very shortly they had not just an abundance of crops, but an overabundance, and they decided to have a feast, a get-together, to celebrate being thankful. And when you go from having nothing to having something, that certainly is much to be thankful for, isn't it? You know, the pilgrims celebrated by giving thanks to God for his provisions and for his grace. Um, We find ourselves in that season today, unfortunately, I think, uh, that for many in the world around us, the concept of being thankful or giving thanks isn't part of their everyday lifestyle. Uh, They will be thankful when the turkey is on the table. And for many people, can I say, turkey ends up on the table once a year. Now, if you're from our church, we're going to have a lot of turkey. Thanksgiving Day, there will be turkey here. My guess is on Saturday, Margie. Probably. Okay. Lots of turkey. But for so many people, their, their spirit and attitude of thankfulness ends when the turkey fixins are gone, when that last turkey sandwich has been eaten. Here's what I want us to look at. God wants us to be a thankful people, not just when the turkey is on the table, but in all aspects of living the life that he has given to us. In every situation that we find ourselves in, we are told that we are to be thankful. And the Apostle Paul puts it this way. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, he says this, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's think for a moment, and let me ask this question. Is our thanksgiving rooted in overwhelming praise to God for our salvation. Are you thankful for the new life that you have in Christ? That's a great amen spot. Because, man, we should be. Are you thankful for the salvation that you have in Christ? Amen! We need to be very, very thankful for that. The alternative would be this, either our thankfulness is rooted in the salvation that we have in Christ, or our thanks is rooted in other things, in stuff. Can I say things come and go, don't they? 
stuff comes and goes. Do we rejoice in the God of our salvation as our strength? And so really the question becomes this. If the worst thing we could possibly imagine were to become true for us today, think about this. Worst thing possible. It happens today. Could we in fact say, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will give thanks to the God of my salvation. You know, I look around the sanctuary and, and all of us at one point or another have been through what we might label as the worst of times for those moments, right? Uh, can I say that life happens to us all? We rejoice in the great things. We mourn in our times of grief, in our times of pain and difficulty. And yet it's in those very times where Scripture says, you know what, we are still supposed to be thankful. And we give thanks to the God of our salvation. I think Thanksgiving, this time of year, uh, here in a couple of days, uh, we will be focusing on that. Um, focusing on the holiday of Thanksgiving. It can be misleading because people think that's the only time that we can give thanks to God. And Scripture never teaches that. Scripture teaches us that we are to be thankful always. We are to be thankful for so many things. We are to be thankful for the good things. We are to be thankful for the bad things, knowing that Christ is there with us, and he is the one who has provided salvation for us. I think very often our thanksgiving and our attitude of thankfulness is rooted in the gifts in the things and the stuff that God gives to us instead of being rooted in God himself. See, is it wrong to be thankful for the homes that we have? Absolutely not. You know, I'm, I'm very thankful for my home. Is it wrong to be thankful for the vehicle that you drive? Not at all. God has provided those things. But if our thankfulness stops at the things that God has given us and, and that's all it is, we have totally missed the point of what it is to be thankful. Uh, we need to be thankful for God himself. And if our thankfulness is rooted in stuff, if our thankfulness is rooted in things, then can I say our thanksgiving is going to be very superficial, it's going to be very shallow. And I would even go on to say that our worship of God is going to be very superficial and very shallow. We need to learn to rejoice and to take joy in the God of our salvation. The prophet Habakkuk provides us an example of someone who understood unconditional thanksgiving. It's the kind of thanksgiving that we should demonstrate. Can I say this? Not all was going well for Habakkuk. Okay? Uh, we did a sermon series on this. I, I went back through my notes and looked. And boy, I think it was about seven years ago when we went through the book of Habakkuk. And I, I looked through some of my notes as I was preparing this, and I'm going, oh, yeah, I remember that. And I read the text. I read the whole book of Habakkuk several times. I'm going, whew, there was an awful lot that was going on. And the book of Habakkuk really is filled with Habakkuk's complaints and the Lord's answers. And in the midst of those complaints and struggles, Habakkuk recognized that things were not going to go well for them. And yet, in spite of all of these things, in Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, we see 
the principle that we are to rejoice in the Lord always. That could be a song. Pretty sure it is. Rejoice in the Lord always. Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Though the fig tree should not bloom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the field, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. And then there's a superscription there that says, To the choir master with stringed instruments. This was a song that would have been sung. So we need to understand the context here when we get to Habakkuk chapter 3, what's going on. Uh, I love how Warren Wearsby puts it. This is one of the greatest confessions of faith found anywhere in the scripture, he says. Habakkuk has faced the frightening fact that his nation will be invaded by a merciless enemy, which is Babylon. The prophet knows that many of the people will go into exile, many will be killed, the land itself will be ruined, and Jerusalem and the temple will be destroyed. Yet, he tells God that he will trust him no matter what happens. Wow. You know, if Habakkuk had depended on his feelings, he would have never have made this great confession of faith. Wouldn't have happened. Habakkuk looks ahead. He saw a nation headed for destruction. And can I say he had every right to be frightened of that. He looks within. He saw himself trembling with fear. He looks around. He sees that everything in the economy is about to fall apart. But then he looks up by faith. He saw God, and in spite of everything that is going on around him, his fears vanished. So right here we see that Habakkuk is very thankful to the Lord, even though uh, what they would call their daily provisions were about to be taken away from them. And can I say, in light of this tragedy that was about to befall them, These verses represent what many commentators have called an unconditional thanksgiving. What does that word unconditional mean? It means not dependent on or conditioned by any external thing, but rooted in God alone, rooted in the experience of the wonder of salvation. Our thanksgiving to the Lord should be unconditional. Just as God's love for his people is unconditional. I want to stop right here and make sure we understand that God's love for his people is unconditional. Why do I want to stop here? Because God's love for people is not unconditional in one sense, right? But we've said it before, before you come to Christ, you're children of wrath, right? God loves us as his creation. He made us. But the love that God has for his children is what is unconditional, okay? You have... You have professed Christ. You have believed Christ. You are his. God's love for his people is unconditional. 
If we were to say that God is love and God loves everybody, there would be no reason for Christ to die on the cross so that redemption uh, could be completed. Why? Because, well, God loves everybody, so it's all good. And nowhere in Scripture do we see that. So we need to know that the unconditional love of God is reserved for his children. That's why it's so important for us. You know what? As we're waiting in line, as Karen has three turkeys under her arms, and she's there at the checkout, and she's just waiting to get them on there, and she's just going like this. She's talking to the person in back of her saying, hey, how you doing? Right? We have a great message to tell about the unconditional love that God has for his children. There's a country song. Oh, it just gets me going. We're all God's children. Have you all ever heard that song? That's the most ridiculous, untheological song I've ever heard. Oh, we're all God's children. What they're saying is it doesn't matter what you believe because God loves you and you're all going to be in heaven. Nowhere in Scripture do we see that. We're going to see next week it says exactly the opposite of that. So we need our thanksgiving to the Lord to be unconditional in the same respect that the love that God has for his children is unconditional and we know that God's love for Israel was definitely unconditional Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 7 and 8 it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you for you were the fewest of all the peoples but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand, redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. The Lord did not deliver Israel from Egypt because he was pleased with the amount of people. Can I say this was not a numbers game? It had nothing to do with that. Israel, as a matter of fact, was not that great in number. He chose Israel because he was faithful to the promise he had made that he would, in fact, make Israel a great nation. God is always faithful and God is ever loving. It had nothing to do with the amount of people. It had everything to do with fulfilling the promises that he had made. And we need to be consistent in our thanksgiving unto the Lord because he is certainly consistent and faithful in loving us. And he has demonstrated that. The thanksgiving that Habakkuk spoke of is a thanksgiving that is not dependent upon any object, upon any thing, or any circumstance. It doesn't find its source in stuff. It finds its source in God alone. That is where it comes from. What's Habakkuk saying? Even if all of my worldly Comforts were taken away. My life becomes desolate. I will still rejoice in the Lord. He was proclaiming that his thanksgiving was not going to stop even though everything had been taken away. We sang a song this morning. Uh, Matt Redman uh, uh, did this, Blessed Be Your Name. Oh, that was a good song. So I must confess, normally each week, uh, toward the beginning of the week, I will text Trish, and I will say, your mission should you choose to accept, right? And I will give her the, the message title, I will give her the message text, and she just runs with it. But I said, I kind of want this one for this week. And thankfully, she didn't say no. Uh, we went ahead and put that in there. But we sang a lyric, Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. 
Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. It goes from one extreme to the other, doesn't it? The song suggests that no matter where we find ourselves, we are to be blessing the name of God. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. I almost want to sing this. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. The lyric goes on to say this, you give and you take away. It doesn't matter where we find ourselves, what situation we find ourselves in, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. That song illustrates beautifully this point. We are so quick to be thankful for all of the good things that come our way, but yet we are very slow when it comes to Bless, or praising God when it seems like everything around us is falling apart. We are told that we are to continue to praise. We are to continue to bless the name of the Lord. We are to continue to be thankful. Habakkuk 3.17 says this, Though the fig should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, the fields yield no food, the flocks cut off from the fold, no herd in the stalls. Uh, Habakkuk is speaking not only of the loss of those everyday comforts, those things that we just kind of take for granted, right? Um, he's talking not just about that, but these are elements that support life. He imagined one of the darkest pictures that a person could possibly know, and he used the agricultural language of the day. The fig tree doesn't bloom. The fig was a stable food for them. Imagine your food source being gone. The labor of the olive fail. Uh, the olive tree brought oil for cooking. The fields would have no meat, no corn, no barley, no crops. Nothing to put into storage. The flocks would be cut off from the fold. Sheep, which would give them wool and meat, would no longer be there. The herds would not be found in the stall. The barns are empty. The livestock are dead and gone. You know what he's, uh, what he's really looking at here is a time of complete economic ruin. And he is seeing all of, this th all of these things. And economic ruin and disaster and circumstances lead to famine, lead to hunger, lead to malnutrition. He's talking about the collapse of the economy. I can remember reading about the Great Depression. Okay. I've, I've talked to people who... Uh, were alive during that time. Many of them were children at the time, but they can remember scrimping for everything that they could get hold of. And you know, older, the older they got and, and late in life, even as they would be in the nursing facility, they would keep every unused napkin. They would keep everything. And you would find piles of these Objects that we just take for granted. They never got over the fact, I might need those someday. Because you never know what's going to happen. Habakkuk finds himself in this very place. Habakkuk said, my job will be gone. My income is cut off. Uh, everything that I need for living is gone. In spite of all of that, I'm still going to be thankful. I'm still going to be thankful. Psalm 51 verse 12 says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Are you thankful for the God of your salvation or are you only thankful for what he gives you 
in this life, the material things and so forth. I remember when I had a house fire, lost everything we had. We had the clothes on our back. And, you know, that was, that was really something. And the insurance adjuster came, and uh, he was a Christian. And that was just fantastic because I was still kind of in a state of shock. And he comes up, he says, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to pray, and then we're going to go into the house. He says, are you okay going into the house? I said, yeah, I, I'm okay to do that. And he said, we are going to make a list of everything that you had in your house. Uh, you know what? Um, that was tough. He did not think that I had a bass boat in the third floor of my house. I tried telling him I did. I didn't. But he wanted titles for every book, every little thing. And here's what he said. He had a very interesting take on this. He said, we're going to make a list. We're going, to, we're going to put it into two different categories. You have junk and you have stuff. Well, boy, if that just doesn't give you the warm fuzzies when you think of your stuff that way. But you know what? He had an excellent point. Here's what his point was. You know what? You lost a lot. But you can still be thankful because we're here having this conversation. I have never forgot that. You have junk and you have stuff. You know what? I'm thankful for the junk. How many of y'all have junk drawers? Junk rooms? Garages? Sheds? Multiple sheds? Okay, you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, we all have those, right? You know what? I'm thankful for everything that God has given to me. But even more than that, we need to be thankful. And our thanksgiving must be in the God who has given all. It must ultimately be thanks to God for his salvation and for his grace that has been extended to me. Can I say after that, everything else pales in comparison, right? We must be thankful. Verse 18, Habakkuk chapter 3, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy. I will take supernatural delight in the presence, the purpose, and the presence of God. I will take a joy in the God of my salvation. He says there's no two ways about it. I will be a person of joy. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. You know what? We as the church... Those who have professed Jesus Christ, those who have believed what Christ has done for us, I think we recognize, I pray that we recognize that everything that we have comes from the hand of Almighty God. Thanksgiving is born in one place. It is born when God has shown us that we are sinners and we realize his amazing love and grace for us. I am blown away. And I was sitting at home in my office at the house uh, uh, yesterday and I'm just kind of contemplating this. And Harold knows this. I, I, I come back to this so often. You know, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I can't even wrap my arms around that. I can't even fathom that. While we were yet sinners, the plan of redemption was put in motion because there was no way I could save myself. We take supernatural delight in the God of our salvation. Can I encourage you in this week? This is going to be a short week for many, right? As we, uh, as we uh, on Thursday, hopefully, prayerfully, be celebrating with family and loved ones. Be thankful 
to be with them, be sharing with them. We'll be doing that here. Many of you in your homes, uh, perhaps with family uh, that you love so much. Um, that, is, that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And God has given us the families that we have. And in him showing us this love and grace, we are thankful always. In this short week, don't get so, so caught up in all of the fixings, right? Don't get so caught up in all this and all that, you know, these recipes that you pull out once a year for Thanksgiving. Some of them are the cranberry, uh, the cranberry sauce, Scott, good stuff. But don't get so caught up in all the stuff and in all the recipes and in all the food. Maybe I should preach on gluttony next week. I won't do that. But don't get so caught up in all of those things that you neglect to be thankful and to rejoice in the God who gave us the gift of Jesus so that we could have forgiveness of sin. And can I say this? Don't just be thankful for that at the end of November, right? Be thankful for it always, each and every day. Uh, we have much to be thankful for. Are you having a good day today? I pray that you are. I pray that you are. Do you know what tomorrow is? Brand new day. It may not be as good as today, right? We don't have promise of that. But whether the days are good or the days are bad, whether the days are long or they speed right by, we have much to be thankful for. Loving Father God, we are here this morning, and Father, we want to acknowledge, Father, that everything that we have comes from you. And Lord, while we are thankful for your provisions for us, Father, we are thankful for the material trappings that we have. We are thankful for the families and the relationships that we have. Father, ultimately, our thanksgiving cannot be found in those things, but Father, needs to be found and rooted in you. We are thankful for your provision. Father, in good times and bad, Father, may we be quick to rejoice in you, the God of our salvation. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.